All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Sacramento Air District's webinar, Turning Down the Heat in Sacramento. I am Shelly Jang. I work for the Sacramento Air District on climate change, and I'd like to introduce our presenter today, uh, the um, she, Ali Lehman. Um, Ali Lehman is a climate scientist who prefers people and conversations to the pipette. Much of Ali's work is inspired by her anxieties about the climate crisis and institutionalized environmental injustice. But she is excited about the solutions, Ali. redress, and healing that we, the collective, can create with thoughtful uh, considerations of submerged perspectives. After her AmeriCorps service year, she's headed back to the East Coast to pursue a career in creative writing neighborhood design. And Ali has been serving as a Civic Spark Fellow here at the Sacramento Air District this year. Hi everyone, like Shelly mentioned, my name is Ali Lehman. For more than two years, Sacramento Air District has been researching the problems and solutions associated with urban heat. Today, I'm really excited to talk to you about what we found while researching and what that means for the communities of Sacramento, particularly as we're thinking about how we're going to stay cool and healthy as we move into a hotter and drier future. Most environmental concerns are very interrelated and urban heat is one that impacts almost every aspect of our daily lives in summer. Um, and this includes the quality of the air that we breathe. This is why we chose to study urban heat as an air district. It's relevant to all the air quality work we do on the day to day and the strategies and adaptation ideas that we talk about today, the ones that make neighborhoods cooler, also make the air and water cleaner. Today I'll start uh, to connect some of these dots and talk about all these issues on this slide here. This is the team that is helping me with the webinar today. We have Ashley and Shelley who will be providing help with facilitation and then we have Terry who is providing our Spanish translation. But before we get started, we're going to review some of the Zoom features that we will be using. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you have a few buttons. The Q&A button is how you're gonna ask questions during the webinar. Feel free to submit these at any point. You can also use the thumbs up or like button if you want to boost a question and we'll know to make it, that question a priority when we're answering questions. I'm gonna stop at a few points in the webinar, check in on these questions and answer them. There will also be time at the end to answer questions. If you are having technical problems at all, you're going to use this chat button and Shelly or Ashley will try and help you out. Lastly, there is the raise hand button. I'm going to ask for feedback a few points during the webinar and you can press this button and we'll know to call on you. This is our first time trying a Spanish translation, a live Spanish translation. And this is also our first Zoom webinar. So. We ask that you exercise a little bit of patience if any technical details do arise, but how you can access the Spanish translation today is this interpretation button. It should also be on the bottom of your screen. There you can toggle between the English and Spanish version. But last note before we get started, we will be recording this webinar and we will share the link afterwards along with a few other resources and the link to our post-webinar survey, which we would love for you to fill out. I want to start with this conversation about urban heat by listening to two different people talk about their personal experiences. Hot weather impacts people very differently based on where they live, their race or ethnicity, what language they speak, income level, age, how much they weigh, how healthy they are. A bunch of things can impact how hot weather is, treats you. While you listen, I want you to think about how the stories may be similar to or different from your own experiences with heat and why that might be the case. I ride my bike seven in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon home. It's a four mile ride. My mouth's like super dry. Can't produce any spit when I'm riding my bike. I stay home with as much as I can. If I don't have to leave, I don't go. Do you feel the summer are changing at all? Like are they getting longer or is it getting hotter? Or? Hotter, drier. I feel like you're cooped inside a lot of the times um, and then when you do have to go somewhere you, it's like heavy duty winters only heavy duty summer you have to plan and like go start your car especially with the baby get the AC going. I remember my mom and I one summer we like 
drove around and passed out ice cold water bottles to people walking or just homeless people. And I feel cooped up in the summer. I don't really do anything. Thank you for listening. I am going to give you a minute to think about your own memories and experiences with heat in the Sacramento region while I refloat my slides here. Okay, so now we're going to help you to think about your memories and experiences. Here's a poll we're launching right now. Please answer, let us know, how much does heat impact your daily life? If anyone wants to share their answer with the group or maybe share an experience that they've had with urban heat, raise your hand, we'd love to hear from you and someone will try and call on you. Okay, maybe we'll give it 10 more seconds on the poll. Okay, here are the poll results. Hopefully you can see them. A lot of people do 40%, 41% um, are experiencing heat most of the days per week, seven days it seems, which makes sense because it is summer and it's pretty hot here. Um, but while we learn more about urban heat today and heat more generally, I want you to keep these stories in mind and this poll we just took, keep these in mind. Heat is a real issue for the people of Sacramento. People regularly do get very ill or sometimes even die because of it. Extreme heat in cities is the most na dangerous natural disaster. Heat kills more people than hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, and lightning combined. Our bodies, our organs in particular, start to break down during heat. The elderly, children, and people with pre-existing health conditions like diabetes or heart disease are the most vulnerable, but heat is very dangerous for everyone and everyone can get extremely ill if they're exposed for extended periods of time or without adequate protection. When the temperatures are high, more people are admitted to hospitals for medical problems, including diabetes, heart disease, urinary tract disease, kidney stones, and respiratory ailments. Heat also affects our social and mental well-being. When it's hot, there are more violent crimes, more mental hospital admissions, and more suicide attempts. So it is pretty dangerous on all fronts. It's no surprise that more poor Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other communities of color experience these impacts more than the population as a whole. Here we see Black people who make up only 14% of Sacramento's total population. They account, Black people account for a quarter or one fourth of the heat-related hospital visits. We're really seeing um, heat impacting people of a color disproportionately, so a lot more, which is unfortunate. During the deadly 2006 California heat wave, 90% of the people that died lived in low income zip codes, which is defined as a place where more than 50% of the people live below the federal poverty line, which is pretty low. In other words, more than 90% of the people that died came from a neighborhood that lacks the political and financial resources. People that spend a lot of time outside are going to be particularly vulnerable or more likely to suffer. This includes agriculture workers, um, other day laborers, and people that are unhoused. Folks that are undocumented and people that are unhoused are often underreported due to certain barriers. So it's important to remember that they might not be included in the data that you're seeing here. People who are physically and socially isolated, a lot of the times this will be elderly people, also get extremely ill when it's hot. Some people can't afford air conditioning, and sometimes they don't have cars either, so they're really stuck in their house when it's hot out. And this is often at times the case for older folks. In a Chicago heat wave in 1995, this was really the case. Older people were dying. In the times of COVID, there are also few safe places to visit during the day. 
to get relief. So even more people trapped in their hot homes. If you are representing an organization today that works with elderly people or just know a lot of older folks, make sure that you're checking on them and the other people who might be stuck at home or don't have cars when it is hot out. Heat is very dangerous for everyone. And we'll send some more information in our post, post webinar email um, with some resources about how to keep cool during the summer. Urban heat uh, can get a little bit technical, but I'm really gonna try and keep things simple today. There are a few key terms that we should know and talk about before we get started. And the first is extreme heat or an extreme heat day, which in Sacramento is when temperatures get above 103.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So 104 degrees essentially. A lot of people will get ill or start to feel very badly well before 104 degrees is ever reached, particularly the people that work outside, elderly people, children, those who are pregnant and people who take public transit. Right now, Sacramento has about four extreme heat days per year, but by 2050, climate scientists say there will be 40. So more than a month of extreme heat days, days over 104 degrees. By the turn of the century, there will be 70. Temperatures are on the rise and in cities, we will see the most amount of heating. Building materials like concrete, asphalt, pavements absorb and retain more heat than forests or rural areas. Also the heat that is generated by running cars, air conditioning and other machines, these things work together to create what we call urban heat. An urban heat island is an area that is hotter than its surroundings. This can be seen at the neighborhood and regional level. This map shows the heat, this, sorry, this map shows the heat patterns of our region really well. We're seeing a proper urban heat island in Yuba City but near Sacramento, we're really seeing the heat bleed out into the suburbs. That's why the phrase urban heat pollution can better represent what's happening in our region. Heat from the built environment of the cities and suburban, more built suburban areas can blow and accumulate in non-urban areas. I work with Sacramento Air Quality Management District as an AmeriCorps fellow. We represent all of Sacramento County and a few other counties in matters that relate to air quality. Keeping temperatures cool is important for our work because heat makes air pollution worse. We are only one of the many air quality management districts in the state and we work together with the California Air Resources Board, which is a state level organization to fight for clean and cool air. Air agencies work together with land use organizations or the people who decide how our cities look. We also work with transportation organizations. Um, so in particular, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors decides what types of things are built and where they are built in our region. They also make sure that people are following the rules and laws about building things. City Council makes similar types of decisions and rules in a similar way, but they also manage how we fix our city streets, plant trees, manage parks, if we have bike lanes or not, and how the city decides to spend its money more generally. So very important organization. Transportation agencies, and we have state, local, and regional ones, they are responsible for the way highways, public transit look, and they're starting to take responsibility for our walking and biking infrastructure. Our project, so the Urban Heat Island project, um, specifically focused on how transportation systems contribute to increased heat. And a transportation system is really the process um, and all the steps and how we get around within the city and beyond the city. The main thing we focused on is how to make a transportation system that can keep the environment cool. Walking, biking, taking public transit and using electric vehicles are all way, are all release a very small amount of heat compared to cars and roads. It's important that the people who are using the type of transportation that keep our region cool have a safe way to do so, safe and shady way to do so. This means strategically placed trees, crosswalks, and bike lanes. We'll talk more about why our current car transportation system is so hot, but let's jump right into our project. We studied how we can re reduce heat burdens and alleviate health impacts by using careful planning and really thinking about how we build our neighborhoods and cities. So there are three things that really contribute to urban heat or create these urban heat islands. Trees and vegetations, 
vegetation reflect the sun's heat energy away from the Earth's surface. Without vegetation, the sun is going to hit the dirt, road, building material, whatever's on the ground. And this surface will likely absorb the sun's heat. Trees and vegetation cool by providing shade, but they also cool through evaporation, which is when the water on their leaves absorbs heat from the outside environment. That does a really good job of keeping us cool. Cities, in particular, the hottest part of cities usually have very few trees and a lot of roads and buildings. Materials like asphalt, concrete, brick, stone, most building materials, particularly the ones that are dark in color, absorb and retain a lot of heat energy from the sun. They are considered to have a low albedo, which is a measurement scientists use to express the percent of the sun's energy that is reflected from a surface. Something dark, like on the left here in this image, maybe a brick building, will have an albedo, albedo that is close to zero. Light colored materials or and special cool reflective materials, like what you're seeing on the right here, they reflect more of the sunlight. So they have a higher albedo, one that's closer to one. If a dark albedo surface absorbs energy, or once not a dark surface absorbs energy, so something with a low albedo, they release it slowly into our environment as heat. This is why sometimes our nights and evenings are really hot, which can be uncomfortable for trying to sleep, but also we really do need our city to cool down at night because it gets so hot in the day. So the third thing that heats up our cities is waste heat. Every machine, computer, vehicle, industrial factory, everything that humans, every machine that a human uses, and we use a lot, they all radiate waste heat. Cars are a huge source of waste heat. Gas engines are very wasteful. Electric vehicles can alleviate some of this burden, but they still generate heat. Air conditioning systems in the power plants that we use to generate the electricity for our air conditioning, these also generate a lot of heat. Inefficient machines that give off a lot of heat are also likely going to generate a lot of air pollution. Oftentimes, these are older things. Sacramento Air Quality Management District currently provides incentives to replace high pollution, high waste machines like old buses, trucks, farm equipment, trains, and even personal vehicles. Uh, we'll, today we'll really focus on how to use trees and albedo replacing dark building materials with reflective surfaces, but machines are also a really important consideration when we're thinking about how we're going to stop urban heat islands and urban heat pollution. So just to review the three reasons for urban heat again, lack of trees and vegetation, too many dark roads and building materials, and then too many machines that are generating a lot of waste heat, such as cars hey, and car plants. Yes. Um, we have a couple of comments and questions. Do you wanna take a minute and we can unmute those? Yes, for sure. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with, Miss uh, Miss Inga Olson. Um, uh, okay, Inga, you're uh, unmuted now. Well, oh, hold on. Inga, can you talk? She's muted still. Okay. Can you unmute her, Ashley? Yeah, I'm working on it. Um, Shelly, do you want to try? Oh, there it goes. Uh, in, anyway, I, I was just saying when I grew up, um, nobody I knew had air conditioning. And um, so, uh, but it wasn't, you know, particularly, we were just used to it. Uh, but it's like, like we put, we, uh, we opened up everything as much as we could at night and then closed it down as soon as the sun started coming in, all the curtains and things. Um, so, um, and you did things in the morning and, and night. But on the other hand, um, I grew up in Carmichael and there's more trees and uh, it was an area that was redlined. So in another area, you could do the same thing and you wouldn't have the same effect um, because there wouldn't be the trees to mitigate. Um, some of that. Anyway, that's, I was just, I was just thinking about that when you were asking starting in the beginning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing Inga.
Are we going to hear from Sue next? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Hopefully, we can call on you soon. In the past, negative attitudes towards people of color led to policies that forced them to live in areas that today have more heat islands and urban heat than other areas in the Sacramento region. Though I don't have the time today to dive into the specifics of how race and class play a role in the way Sacramento looks today, um, this is a really important consideration and does deserve time and energy. The communities that have been targeted for oppression lack certain financial and political considerations. And now we see areas with wide streets, busy highways, and very few trees and vegetation. This all means that they're gonna be hotter for urban heat islands. Unfortunately, in these neighborhoods, we also find the communities that are in most needs of financial and political consideration. That's gonna be low-income people, immigrants, black, indigenous, Latinx people, and other people of color. In many of the areas that are hotter, we also see older housing that is not well insulated and requires more air conditioning to keep it cool. Some people in these hot communities and others can't afford air conditioning. So what we just heard about from Inga or just not having access to air conditioning. Hot neighborhoods also have less shade from trees often, which you can see here, some of the differences in tree shade. People in uh, poor neighborhoods are more likely to rely on public transit, which means that we're going to see more people walking and standing outside when it's hot. If you're spending a lot of time outside without a cool place to go afterwards, we're going to see a lot of heat illness and heat exhaustion. Houses in wealthier neighborhoods, however, usually have air conditioning. And the people usually have lots of trees, swimming pools, libraries, and other ways to cope with extreme heat. The map on the left is broken up by race, not class, but the results are a little bit jarring. The map on the right shows the tree canopy cover. So the darker the green, the more trees there are. And then the map on the left shows a racial breakdown of neighborhoods. So a lighter color means that the neighborhood's gonna be more white. And if it is darker, it's gonna be more diverse and have more people of color. So in the white neighborhood, the white neighborhoods in Sacramento are really the ones that are most heavily treated. That's gonna be Sacramento, Land Park, and um, the grid. And then if we're going more north or south, we're seeing fewer trees and this is where more people of color tend to live. Race and class issues should be central when considering environmental planning decisions. Heat in particular costs a lot of money due to air conditioning and lives, so it's not really fair to disproportionately burden some people um, with these financial and death costs. When we develop and implement strategies, poor black, brown, and indigenous communities should really be the focus. But these are also the communities uh, where it's most beneficial to implement these strategies if we wanna maximize the cooling of the region. When we develop and implement strategies, these yellow areas on the map are the neighborhoods that have been identified by our scientists as the places to where we can get the most bang for our buck for implementing some of the cooling strategies we're gonna talk about right after this. And we do see these priority areas overlapping highly with some of the more low income neighborhoods and more diverse neighborhoods. Whoops. Um, Okay, the, this, this image is showing the Delta Breeze, which is a wind that blows up from the Sac Sac sorry, San Francisco Bay Area. It blows the heat that's produced in the areas with the fewest trees, um, which is really going to be the city, and blows it north into the sub suburbs and more rural areas. So everyone in the city really has a selfish stake on concentrating these cooling efforts in our hottest communities. Our research shows we can essentially eliminate the urban heat island effect, particularly if we work together as a regional community. There are three prescriptions or urban heat solutions um, that would essentially eliminate urban heat islands according to our scientists. The first is a tree focused prescription. For this one, we would have to plant 2.5 to 3 million new trees. 
as well as maintain the ones we already have. But on this map here, where the darkest green indicates one degree, so one full degree Fahrenheit of cooling, we can really see the whole city of Sacramento is going to benefit from this and even some of the more north areas. Our second prescription involves switching dark pavements um, and building materials to special cool reflective technologies or just painting them lighter colors. This prescription provides a lot of cooling during the daylight hours because this is really when the sun is the hottest and more of the sun will be reflected back into the sky. To achieve uh, the albedo increase we would need for this prescription, we would have to switch one third of the dark roofs in Sacramento with special cool technology roofs. This many new cool roofs would reduce the amount of heat absorbed absorbing surfaces in our region and save us quite a few degrees, particularly in the hottest parts. There's a lot of research on technology for cool roofs. They can be even normal colors, as we can see at the bottom here. This, the bottom row of tiles is regular roofs and then the top row of tile, tiles is cool roofs and they are essentially the same. If you don't like cool roofs, we could instead replace 4,000 miles of our asphalt city roads with special cool pavement options. The city of LA, which you can see here, use special road paints that are white to change these, change the surface from being black to a light color, so increasing the albedo. Other places like Houston and Phoenix have started to use concrete, which again have lower albedo than asphalt. Our last prescription is a combination of the first two prescriptions essentially. So we're going to be increasing the albedo and planting 2.5 to 3 million new trees. This would do a lot to cool at both night and during the day. And on this map here where 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit, so basically three degrees cooling is the darkest color, we can see that quite a few areas are going to be three degrees cooler if we implement this prescription. Even Sacramento, which isn't the darkest color, would see about a two degree, two degrees of savings on heat, which can be really significant during the summer, particularly when we're thinking about our vulnerable populations. And of course, because this is the most effective, it's the one that we recommend. We also explore the cooling effects of things like solar panels, electric vehicles, cool walls, which is basically just painting build inside of cities rather than on new suburban and rural land. These methods can help as well towards cooling, but the prescriptions that we mentioned just now are going to be a lot more effective. If you're interested in the maps or data for any of these, if you send us an email, which I'll post later, we'd be happy to send them to you. Okay, I tried to show you this map earlier, but my slides got out of order. So these are the priority cooling areas. These yellow areas are where our modeler suggested, or this is where the scientists say, uh, we're gonna get the most bang for our buck when we are putting in new cool roofs and new cool roads and planting trees. And again, a lot of these areas are overlapping with neighborhoods of color and low income neighborhoods. And I can pause right now to take some questions if anyone has anything. Okay, we'll try to unmute Sue again. There might be a box that pops up, Sue, that you have to accept. And we also have some questions in the Q&A box that we can maybe address right now. Yeah, um, we, we, have, we have a question from Patricia Shelby. Does the higher albedo materials cause a reflection for pedestrians and drivers or for vision or glare? Is there increased heat on those persons or materials around the reflective materials? Shelby, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so basically for our study, we capped the albedo at a level where there will be no glare impacts. So it is not um, 
at the most pos highest possible reflective level, the albedo is capped at 0 0.5. So there are no reflective issues for pedestrians and drivers. And in fact, at night, there's a positive benefit for drivers because you're able to see better, see the road better when you're driving around. Um, is there increased heat on the persons or materials around the reflective materials? I think this is something that scientists are working on right now. Um, there has been a small study that was done in LA where they did, they did show some small heat impacts for pedestrians, but that was, um, there were, there were um, just, uh, though I think that that was a initial study where there were some issues with the way the temperatures were measured. So I think that there are other, um, uh, other studies that can be done on this fact, but um, we do know that it does lower temperatures at the above ground air level, which is um, what we look at in the study, which is about the at, at the area of six feet in the air, which is about um, where many people, um, the, the air that many people experience on a day to day basis. And then we have another question about how information is being used to require features in all buildings and retrofitting existing communities of color. Maybe we'll address that. Do you want to address that question now or at the end? Let's address it now because we've already read it. So this is relatively new information. I should clarify, this study was just released or we're just starting to release this study and this is one of the first times we've actually shared with community members. But right now, Shelley is meeting with a lot of jurisdictions and advising them on these types of issues. There are some issues, um, particularly planting trees in communities of color, or a lot of people claim that there are issues, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. So I will, we can, I hope that's enough for a tease of an answer and we'll get into it more. And then I'll quickly answer Justin's question. Um, so yes, these are not all of the priority areas, the one you're, the, the slide we're looking at right now. There are other areas where our scientists actually recommended the, these types of cool mitigation strategies, but these are the ones where it is the most bang for your buck. And then there are a few areas where there's less bang for your buck, but also significant. So maybe West Sacramento is one of the areas on some of our other priority rankings, but I don't have that in front of me, so I could not speak to that. I could just jump in for a second to say that West Sacramento didn't have a particular extremely high heat island effect, and that's one of the reasons why it didn't show up as a priority area. Um, so we're, we're not just taking into account whether communities have been um, underserved or disadvantaged in the past, but also the, the absolute heat island effect for many places in Yolo County was relatively lower compared to the other parts of the county. Okay, and maybe I will return to questions in a bit and get back to this presentation, but the rest of the people, thank you for asking. We will answer those. Okay, so those are pr three prescriptions. They come with quite a few benefits beyond just keeping the temperatures cool. Heat and air quality are two issues that are completely intertwined. Heat makes air pollution a lot worse by increasing the formation of two dangerous air, pollu air pollutants, ozone and particulate matter. Both are dangerous gases for our lungs and they are created when heat and sunlight react with the pollution that's released from gas vehicles and things like factories or power plants. That's why it's really concentrated near highways. When temperatures are high and the air is dry, we also see a lot more wildfires, which are terrible for our lungs, the smoke from these fires and a lot of our other organs. Trees are great for so many health and social reasons. The leaves can also absorb pollution when it lands on their leaves, leave, which leaves our air a lot cleaner. Trees can also be great at removing carbon from our atmosphere, which is the greenhouse gas that is making temperatures rise. If we are able to keep our cities cooler, then we will use less, less electricity to cool our homes. This will definitely lower energy bills for everyone in the summer, but it also means less air pollution is gonna be created 
um, from the power plants that generate our electricity that we use for our air conditioning. If we plant trees according to our plan, so 2.5 to 3 million trees, it could reduce the electricity needed for air conditioning by 57 or almost 60% in the city of Sacramento. Lower bills and also fewer blackouts because when we have a lot of people trying to use electricity at the same time, we get blackouts, which are really dangerous. but there are a lot of different ways we can achieve these prescriptions, the ones that our study came up with. Let's spend a little bit of time imagining a capital region that has made commitments to urban heat and the prescriptions we mentioned by exploring how other cities and communities are keeping healthy and cool. Many people in our community rely on bus and light rail to get around, but our bus and light rail stations are not comfortable currently particularly as we're trying to reduce the amount of people that are driving for to keep our climate cool more generally, um, it's really important that it's not a huge difficulty to take public transit. Imagine if our public transportation provided stops that were ready for high temperatures and even worked to cool communities. We ha see a good example of this in Phoenix, Arizona, where a place where it is already hot, really hot. The city of Phoenix includes things like shade, drinking water, cool pavements, seating at their public transportation stops. They even have emergency call buttons. So if there's a heat emergency, people can't get help. We, according to our prescription, we have to plant 2.5 to 3 million trees, which is a lot. The paths to and from transit stops can be a great place to put these. In other areas where there are high volumes of pedestrians and cyclists. These really should be prioritized so people have a safe and shady place to walk and travel during heat events. If we do have places that are safe and comfortable, more people are gonna bike and walk, which is really exciting and has compound and cooling effects. Phoenix on the left here, this is their plan to shade a sidewalk and bike path and create a little cool island in the middle, but places in Europe like Paris on the right have been doing this for decades. You can tell because their streets are extremely shady and comfortable. In Sacramento, when it's really hot, our bus stops are still pretty unsafe for people to use. Sacramento Air Quality Management District is piloting an incentives program or giving money to organizations to renovate a transit stop in the floor in South Sacramento. But as of today, there is not consistent funding for such type of transit stop innovation projects. If this is something you think is important, we would love to hear about it because this type of work definitely does cross over with what we do. So this kind of talks about the, one of the questions I saw, but um, in our neighborhoods, particularly the ones that have been historically neglected and even targeted for oppression, it can be hard to find places to put trees. Um, this can be because of like power and water lines and in some neighborhoods we aren't seeing that grassy median between the sidewalk and the road, which can be dangerous for pedestrian reasons, but it also makes it hard to find places to plant trees. Parks provide community with a lot of benefits, but they are also a place where we can concentrate these 2.5 to 3 million trees that we need to plant. New parks require a lot of coordination to create, so it's pretty difficult, but Seoul, South Korea, so a place with a lot less space, um, recently added over a thousand new parks within their city limits. They use an idea called pocket parks, which are a small, small space that can be created by closing roads, reorganizing parking lanes and parking lots, or reclaiming vacant lots. On the right is an example from New York City, so again, a place um, with not a lot of space. Top left is a picture of Culver City, which is a green space. It's also Culver City's near LA, so it's a little bit more desert, but green space underneath a highway. And then COVID has really created a precedent for closing off streets and parking for pedestrians and other people, like people that are dining at restaurants. 
So the picture on the lower left is a place in Sacramento where the streets have been converted into a place for bikers and pedestrians. These types of, this is hope that these pocket parks are more of a realistic ask moving into the future. Imagine if Sacramento invested in the health and robustness of its community, of its parks by adding trees and cool pavements. Again, we need to add 2.3 million trees, 2.5 to 3 million trees. Um, we don't have a lot of space in the city and pocket parks are pretty hard to create still things considered. So if we add them to our parks that already exist, we can create these cool islands. The park on the left, which is Sutter's Fork, has a ton of trees. So this is definitely gonna be a cool island, but the park on the right, which is in Northern Sacramento, has a lot of dirt, which is dark colored. So it actually does absorb a lot of the sun and sometimes even heat due to this low albedo. If we added more trees and maybe a cool pavement to the park on the right, then we could create a cool island or a place um, that cools the surrounding community and even can be a safe space, safe space to hang out during heat events. During heat events. A lot of people in our region are experiencing homelessness and they need special considerations, not only because they spend more time outside, but because they don't have access to safe drinking water oftentimes. I want to tell you a little bit about Crystal who sleeps in a tent along the American River Parkway. Before the pandemic, she went to fast food places for water and ice when it was hot, but now she calls a mutual aid or volunteer organization when she needs water. I'm quoting her here. Some people are drinking river water, which is unsafe, and then some people are just dehydrated because there's no way to get water. According to an advocate for Loaves and Fishes, some of the folks that are unhoused have even resorted to drinking water out of the hand washing stations that have been placed near camps. Uh, so this creates safety issues because this is not potable water, but then also people cannot wash their hands to protect themselves during this pandemic. Water is a huge issue. We need more water, public water fountains at bus stops and in parks, maybe something similar to what we see here in Seoul, London, and Chongqing, China. Everyone would be better off, particularly kids and elderly people, if we made these types of commitments. Okay, I'll take a little break and we can do another poll. At this point, you've heard a few ideas. Um, if any of them, are any of them resonating with you when you're thinking about your own community? We've talked about trees, cool pavements, cool roofs, and cool machines. Um, but we'd like to hear from you now. What are the things that you want to see in your community? And if you want to volunteer and say anything out loud, please raise your hand. Okay, maybe we give it 10 more seconds. Allie, do you wanna try taking a couple more comments here? Comments or questions? Or questions, I, we have a couple hands raised. Okay, yeah, please, please call on the people that raise their hand, have their hands okay. raised. Um, S. Johnson, try to unmute you now. M. Johnson? Yes, yes you. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm really enjoying this. I'm a retired school teacher, and um, I appreciate having the opportunity to give some input. Um, I live near McKinley Park, which is a beautiful green park. Uh, one of the things that the city's been doing a lot is taking out trees and taking out a lot of our canopy trees. And I would really like to see something happen, a movement happen that would encourage the city to put in more shade trees when they, reach, uh, when they tear out these beautiful historic 
canopy trees, they replace them with something like a crepe myrtle or, you know, something much smaller and, um, and it doesn't provide as much shade, doesn't cool down the area. You know, the roots hold a lot of water that cools the ground. When the ground's cool, you know, it just, it, it, it kind of permeates the whole area. The other thing I wanted to mention is in your the slides earlier, when you showed the different neighborhoods, um, you showed Land Park as an example of an affluent neighborhood with all that green space around it. One of the things that we found out after trying to get uh, better irrigation here at our park is that um, uh, Land Park actually has wells that were dug on the properties. And I've often wondered what it would be like if we had a large well drilling um, uh, project going on where wells were drilled and put into parks. The water's underground and if it's irrigating the parks and feeding the grass and feeding the trees, it then goes back underground and, and restores the aquifers. So Ali, you sound like you're in a position to do something about this. So I'm <laughs> throwing my idea out there. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, unfortunately, our jurisdiction, we don't really deal with parks, but we are in collaboratives with people that do deal with parks and that's extremely interesting. I actually did not know that about Land Park. So thank you so much for sharing. Okay, uh, Patricia Shelby, you're unmuted. Well, all right, thank you. Uh, this, this has uh, been very interesting thus far. Uh, I just want to say on your on your poll, two points. First point, on your polling, if in future you can do some of this as kind of maybe rank polling, because there was really more than one that I would would have and being able to prioritize those would be would be nice. If we got rank polling, we might even get a, 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 be, a better feel of what people are saying instead of having to choose one. And there were things I couldn't choose because cool pavements arose. I don't know what the costs are. And so if that's something that is, could really become, come close to us. Uh, the other is, uh, and, and maybe you're gonna get to that, so let me know, what are the other types of vegetation that besides trees, because sometimes we're in spaces where a tree isn't going to fit, its root system isn't going to fit, what can we do? And is that beneficial to bring back butterflies, hummingbirds, uh, bees, other positive uh, uh, insects and, and, and life to the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, so I'll quickly mention the types of vegetation. Actually, part of our study did focus on different types of trees, actually, but thought or did the science behind which types of trees provide the most cooling. In terms of other types of vegetation that provide a lot of cooling, um, if you have seen the types of like natural grasslands, so switching from a lawn to something that is more native type of grassland, those can provide a lot of cooling. We saw this earlier in the in the Phoenix picture of Phoenix. Um, these types of vines. So really covering up the dark surfaces with green spaces, this can provide a lot of cooling and then things like shrubs. And thank you so much for um, your comments on our webinar. Those are actually very helpful. All right, uh, Vincent Valdez, you've been unmuted. Okay, I just had a few comments. Um, I like the Fruit Ridge Park. Uh, that is off of Fruit Ridge Road in South Sacramento, correct? The bus stop? The Fruit Ridge Park with the Lamb Park and the, could you bring that slide back up? I wanted to take a picture of it actually. Okay, and this is the... The Lamb Park and the Fruit Ridge Park slide. I think oh, the, with all the trees. Yes, the tree canopy. And that's the that's a big issue that we're talking about uh, trying to correct. And so um, the roofing, I have a question on the roofing. So how do we get roofing on the, on the homes? Yeah, so this LA actually, they do a lot of great things with heat because they're a lot hotter than us. So they give people a little bit of money back when they buy cool roofs. And this is actually something that we had here in Sacramento. 
SMUD provided this, but people weren't using it, so they canceled it. But if we make a commotion about this or talk to the right people and tell them that we need this, um, it's definitely reasonable to have something like a cool roof incentive for regular people to buy cool roofs. And you said you're not working with parks to get trees in there. Uh, the other picture was the one when you had Waymanland Park on the left and Fruit Ridge Park on the right. Oh, okay. Was it maybe this one? I have no idea. I can send you the slides afterwards. Okay. That would be helpful. That, that would be helpful. And um, so, yeah, I'm enjoying the, uh, the discussion and there's, there's some, some really good information in here. It would be slide, Thank 30, you. slide 37 I saw. Mm, this one. Yes. All right. Thank you, Vincent. Do we have another time, more time to answer one more question, or do we need to hold that until we get through the rest of the slide? Can we hold it till the end? Yes. Okay, thank you, and thank you for being patient whoever is waiting to ask. Um, but yes, hopefully you saw the poll results. Seems like street trees are definitely the winner, but again, we know that maybe there are some limitations of the how we're polling, um, but I do want to remind you that there is a going to be a post webinar survey. So if you want to, on that option, we will let you choose more than one. Um, but yes, thank you for everyone for sharing. The technology needed to stop urban heats, it all exists. It's been tested and it's safe and reliable to use. Oftentimes the prices is comparable to the regular technology. And we see that being true in the case of roads and cool roofs. After our research, we know the areas that need this technology the most. So there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the possibility of reducing urban heat in our region and completely stopping urban heat islands. As we start to use these strategies to cool the air, they will also become cheaper and more readily available. The cities that have implemented measures like cool roof incentives or cool pavements for their city roads have seen the cost of these materials fall significantly, which make them more affordable for regular people to use. Among our governments and politicians, urban heat is becoming more of a priority. We haven't quite achieved the widespread commitment and action that is needed. Making community voices and their needs center in our planning process helps to get appropriate cooling measures in the neighborhoods that need them. You all really are the experts about what's happening in our neighborhoods and you're the ones that can help us steer, you can help steer us towards a cooler Sacramento. The Sac Metro Air Quality Management District is trying to do a better job of making the needs of the community a focus of our work, but again, we can do a lot better. And we'd love to hear from you again in our post survey about how you'd like to be engaged on these issues by us. In LA, we see more, uh, more of a community presence when they're talking about things like heat planning. LA City Council actually has a multidisciplinary committee that helps advise them on the types of laws and strategies they go about focusing on when trying to cool their cities. And this committee includes people like professors from universities, the public, so community members, educators, community groups, etc. Um, this is by no means a complete list of ways to work towards a cooler Sacramento. It's really only scratching the surface. And we're gonna have to work with all of you to come up with options that work best for our region. I just quickly want to use the poll to ask this question. So maybe we take 30 seconds. Um, but does urban heat at all align with your work and or interests? Okay, maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, well, Shelly works on that poll. Okay, so pretty much everyone, which is exciting. Um, if you were part, 
Okay, well, now I'm going to stop her questions, but I'm going to jump to the end and say our conclusion in case we run over and you can't stay. So I'm going to turn back to questions in a second. And that's mostly for Terry, so she can follow along with the Spanish translation. If you are a part of a government or community organization that would like to be involved with stopping urban heat, email us. If you want to get involved as a community member, we have a cool ambassadors program. Basically, you can learn how to be an activist for urban heat in your community. I will send a link to this in our follow-up email, along with our feedback survey, which I mentioned a few times, and a few other resources about urban heat. I hope you feel more confident in your knowledge about urban heat after leaving this webinar. And um, I really do hope this will be the first of many conversations about urban heat. And now I'm gonna take a moment to answer questions, see how many we can do. Maybe we could spend five extra minutes if you don't mind, but also feel free to feel free to email any questions. Um, I'm gonna and, um, start with the, the last person that had their hand raised and that was Inga Olson. Perfect. All right, Inga. Yeah, um, in my neighborhood, there was an old school that now is like an administration building, but it's uh, the grass area is locked up all day long with locks, so you can't get in unless you climb the fence. And um, I think that would be a, a perfect place to add more trees and native plants and even garden spaces for the community or composting and that kind of thing. Um, do you have any thoughts? Does uh, the air um, quality district help incentivize that kind of thing? Or, uh, you know, is there any help out there like to help, you know, if you got some neighbors together to do something? So to the city, and maybe I'll pass this off to Shelly if I miss anything, but the city right now might not be great people to turn to this. I'm thinking particularly of Sacramento Tree Foundation. They do a lot of great work with communities. They, I mean, for your personal home, they'll provide you with a free tree and send you a consultant to help tell you where to plant it to get the most amount of cooling for your house. And they have worked in the past with community groups to do things like neighborhood, neighborhood greening. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Okay, now I'm just looking through some of these questions and comments. Thank you so much for submitting these and again, everyone else who volunteered. And if you'd like to ask a question in, in these last few minutes, please do raise your hand. Um, okay, so I'm seeing one question about Carmichael being redlined. I don't personally know anything about that, but maybe if Inga wants to come back and expand upon it, she's welcome to. But I like these other these other comments. Um, trees are extremely expensive to maintain, and that's something that's often left out of the conversation. And they can honestly be a little bit dangerous sometimes, particularly when you're thinking about how they can fall. But the things with both of these issues is, well, A, planting trees, they're expensive, but they also provide a lot of cooling. Like I mentioned earlier, if we plant these 2.5 to 3 million trees, we're gonna see the electricity due to air conditioning cut by 60%. So that's providing a lot more, it's saving a lot more money than it's costing. Um, we also had a question from Patricia Shelby in the chat box. Um, so since that's not in the q and I'll read that question right here. Um, what is the cost of these materials in comparison to tr traditional materials? especially for retrofitting in lower income neighborhoods. Shelly, maybe you could answer this one. Sure. Um, so for cool roofs, um, I think there is a range of costs for some of these materials and some of them can be um, similar to the cost of a regular roof, especially if there uh, is also the additional electricity savings that you get from using a cool roof because then your house will be cooler. Um, with cool pavements, that is basically, they also come again in a range of costs and some of them are more expensive and some of them are less expensive. Um, so 
right now some of the things that we're doing is we're presenting this information to city departments to help them you know consider some of these heat island benefits when they're replacing a roof or a pavement um and then i think for example there's also things that homeowners can do that are very low cost like painting your walls white that can also help you your house uh, absorb less heat in the summer and also save on your electricity bills Um, okay, and then if no one's raising their hand, maybe the last question I'll address, and I can send emails to the other questions, um, and the questions that you asked in, during registration, but this one's from Vincent, and it's asking about the areas that would be a first priority for trees, and again, it's going to be these yellow areas on the map, um, but also the areas that are where people are walking, taking public transit, and biking a lot. So along bike paths or sidewalks would definitely be a top priority. Okay, um, so we have one final poll for this evening, if you've hung around. And our question is, whoops, that's not the right question. Um, after hearing this webinar, are you more likely to take action on urban heat? And I'll give you a moment to answer this while we close up. But again, I hope this will be the first of many conversations about urban heat and heat pollution in our region. Again, if you have any questions or comments, you can either email those to me or send them along when you take our post-webinar survey. Maybe I'll give you 10 more seconds to answer this poll. Okay, I feel like it's calculating the answers for us. Great, so we love to see that. Um, but we've won some cool advocates today. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you'll be in touch again with this post webinar survey. And I hope you have a safe and cool evening. I look forward to reading all your survey responses. Thank you again for joining.